علي من الشيطان الرجيم بفضل الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة غريب يا مظلوم كربلاء يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله الحكيم في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رأيت من اتخذ إلهه هواه أفأنت تكون عليه وكيلا أم تحسب أن أكثرهم يسمعون أو يعقلون إنهم إلا كالأنعام بل هم أضل سبيلا صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد On the path to support Imam Al-Hussein Salawatullahi Alayhi for us to be on that path and to become of the supporters, there are many obstacles and there are many trials. And it is important for us to understand the support and understand what it means and understand the trials that stand between us and achieving this support. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse in the Holy Quran, it's very important. He speaks of a people. He says, have you seen the one who takes... His desire as his God. Do you think that one like this perceives or knows anything? He says, nay. They are animal-like. Rather, they are in a worse state than animals. That a person that just follows his desire, this is what I feel like, this is what I'll do. That's what I feel like saying today, so I'm saying it. No regard. I'm going to do this, no regard. They don't think towards the future. They don't think how it affects the people around them. It is important for us to understand that this sort of person and this sort of personality is un-Islamic. It's something that is away from Islam. It's something away from the people who are the supporters of Imam al-Hussein sallallahu alayhi Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, Abd al-Shahawat adhallu min Abd al-Riq. That a person who is a slave to his desires is more humiliated than a person who is an actual slave that's been captured and taken as an actual slave. Because being a servant to your desires and a servant to your whims, you create that to become your God. This becomes your criteria and this becomes what it is that you follow. On the path to becoming a supporter of Imam al-Hussein sallallahu alayhi like everything in faith, religion, iman, which means faith, it comes in varying degrees. And in fact, the ulama refer to it not as degrees, but as hues of a color. So when you look at a color, a color has various hues. And the hues are very different and they're closer to degree than any other sort of measurement that you can think of. That this measurement changes ever so slightly, the color changes. This is the same thing. For example, we spoke about if you want to be of the supporters of Imam al-Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa and you want to be a true free person, that you should be one who remembers Imam al-Hussein alayhi For example, when they drink water, who condemns the killers of Imam al-Hussein at all points in his life. Somebody who whenever remembers, they remember Imam al-Hussein, they say, Ya laytana kunna ma'akum, and they mean it, we wish we were with them. In the same way that when we cry over Imam al-Hussein, we heard the narration say that even the smallest teardrop that comes down will extinguish the wrath of Allah. The smallest teardrop that comes down will allow you to enter paradise. So when we heard these sorts of things, we now understand that also with this, there are varying degrees. And so when we look at crying over Imam al-Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa because this is a form of support, there's three types and three levels of crying. Level one is sadness. Crying over Imam al-Hussein because it's a sad story. It's a tragedy. When we hear of any tragedy, if you look, for example, now at what's happening in Afghanistan and uh, how the, the Taliban are raging over the country, and just killing people. You see this, and this is something that's truly saddening. Anyone that sees this and cries, it's nothing. 
Of course, you would cry. It's a sad tragedy. It's, it's a very sad thing that's happening. So, for, so when you see this and you cry about it, this is something that is normal. <clears throat> and so some people, they cry about Imam Hussain's tragedy because of the sadness, which is good. This is part of support. But then there's a level above this. The level above this are the ones who cry mahabbatan bil Hussein. That they have love for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and therefore they cry because of their love for Hussein. This is now a higher level. All of a sudden, why they have ma'rifah of Abu Abdullah al-Hussain sallallahu alayhi There's a narration, for example, that says, if you go to visit Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, may Allah grant us all the privilege of visiting the grave of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. The hadith says that when you go to visit Amir al muminin you get X amount of reward. And then when you return, it's multiplied by two or four or a hundred times in the narration. And the reason being that a person that goes to visit a middle mu'minin is something, but then when after his visit, he comes back, he's different. His reward is elevated because he has some un, so a, a little bit greater understanding of the imam. So the person that cries, Mahabbatan lil Imam al Hussein, this is a level above. The third <coughs> is the one that cries in empathy and sympathy for Imam al Hussein When I say sympathy, I mean muwasat. Sympathy means that you cry about, I wish I could have been there. Like what we spoke about, Imam al-Asr, Imam al-Hujjah, Ajla al-Sahab al-Asr al-Zaman, Ajla al-Farju al-Sharif, when he cries in that manner, that if it were not for the eons of time, and were it not for Allah's decree that I am not to be there, and I couldn't be there to fight and protect you. Therefore, I am going to mourn you day and night and cry over you until I cry tears of blood. That crying of saying, I really wish I was there with you, but I can't be there with you. And I, my body wants to be there. My soul wants to be there. There's nothing left. The only thing I can do is cry. And therefore, I cry in sympathy for you, Abba Abdullah. See how the, the levels differentiate. And this is uh, ultimately very important to us when we look towards the supportership of Imam al Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa or people who want to be supporters of Imam al Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa Now, on this path to becoming a supporter of Imam al Hussein alayhi wa to become a supporter, a person <coughs> must go through trial. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us go through trial to allow us to grow and to become elevated. Now these trials that we go through, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts people whom he loves through trial. In Ahabba Allah Abdan, Ibtala. There's a hadith that says if Allah loves a servant, he tries him and he tests him. Because this allows you to get increased levels of elevation. Now that we have this degree of understanding and we want to be people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test us and allow us to become elevated, Firstly, we need to understand that there is no excuse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala proves the proof to everybody. And just a few small examples, particularly for uh, the youth. So sometimes somebody says, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put me in this situation. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made me so handsome, I can't help it. The women won't keep away from me. Or he made me so handsome, I can't help it. I must show my beauty to the world. You know, and, and, and she removes her hijab with the, a cheer of support from the social media crowd. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this instance, on the day of judgment, he'll say, this is Yusuf. Yusuf who was so beautiful. And look what he did. When he was put in a compromising situation, he remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he, he didn't do anything. The example of modesty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show Sayyidah Maryam. This is the example, for example. And he will say, this is Sayyidah Maryam, who look at the situation she was in and, in and the difficulty she was in, but her modesty and her chastity allowed her to be elevated to the station that she was elevated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being the only woman that's mentioned by name in the Holy Quran. And mentioned uh, a, a great deal, a whole chapter is named after Sayyidina Maryam Sallallahu Alaihi So I sit there and I say to myself, I want to be of the supporters of the Ansar of Imam Al-Hussain Alayhi Salam. Why? Because I have understood and seen that this is a real role model. This is a true hero. This is somebody who is real salvation from the, the ailments of this world 
and of the hereafter. So I want this person to be my role model and I want to take him uh, and I want him to take me and accept me as a supporter. Now the problem is when we look at Imam al Hussein sallallahu alayhi in Karbala, the heart of Imam al Hussein was so great that we heard yesterday or the day before that he even gave water to his enemies and he even called down their horses. And not only that, he was concerned with their welfare. That even though they were coming to kill him, there was no doubt he continued to give them advice. And advise them and say, you don't have to do this. You don't have to achieve the station in the fire of hell for murdering the last of Ahl al-Kisa. He even had special meetings with Umar ibn Sa'ad himself, the, the commander of the Umayyad army, the commander of Ibn Ziyad's army. He had meetings with him and he said to him, he gave him offers. He said to him that... Uh, why are you continuing on this? He said to him, well, I'm being forced by Ibn Ziyad and I have lands. So they will take my lands. Imam al Hussein tells him, I have lands in Medina. You can have those lands. And then he says to him, I fear for my life. And Imam al Hussein says, you will be under our protection. And then he says to him, and I have family there. The Imam al Hussein continues, refuses, sorry, uh, uh, that, to even argue that point. Because Imam al Hussein had brought his family and his children with him to Karbala. But Imam al Hussein was still concerned with them and he still spoke to them. He told them things that were very reasonable and simple. Remember, with the Hur, the Hur accepted immediately that were you other than the son of Fatima, I would have said something else. But when he told them, he said, Look to the east and the west. Is there any other son of your Prophet's daughter than me anywhere? It's clear. So this is a very clear uh, proof that he gives them. And they see this proof, and yet it's falling on what? Deaf ears. Why? The hadith on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, لَوْلَا أَنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ يَحُومُونَ حَوْلَ قُلُوب بَنِي آدَمْ لَرَأَوْ مَلَكُوتُ السَّمَوَاتِ لَرَأَوْ مَلَكُوتُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ He says that were it not for the demons, the shayateen that float around the heart of the son of Adam, he would have seen he would have seen the unseen creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heavens and upon the earth. He would have comprehended and understood. In another narration of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, لَوْ لَا تَكْثِيرْ فِي كَلَامِكُمْ وَتَمْرِيجْ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Were it not for you talking so much, you just speak so much, and were it not that your hearts were insincere, he says, then surely you will see what I see and you would hear what I hear. These people were deaf, dumb and blind, from the amount of sins that they had done. Deaf, dumb and blind, when, that, because whenever they had a choice, they chose to go with Iblis. Whenever they had a choice, they chose the incorrect choice. So when it came to the important part, when Imam al Hussein calls them and says, is there any helper? Is there any Ansar? Nobody heeded his call, except for the people that were with him and understood. And everybody else was like they were deaf, even though some of them understood. And I'll tell you, you'll see this, that in Ziyarat Ashura, which we've been reading every night, one of the most important Ziyarat, and it's a Ziyarat that's, that's uh, highly mustahab to say, on the day of Ashura. And inshallah, uh, just in between my talk, the Al Ja'fari will be doing the Maqtal on Thursday before the people that do Taqlid of Sidil Khu'i and other Maraja that agree with the single horizon. But the followers of Sid Sistani is pretty much anyone that's younger than me and the other maraja, it will be inshallah on Friday. Friday will be the actual Ashur. Uh, uh, and uh, keep your eye on the website to see if we have a, a program there. However, that is the day for Ziyarat Ashura. That is the day of the Mustahab Ghusl. So for people, and that is the day if you want to get a day off work, uh, as it is makruh to do anything on that day. You have a Zoom meeting, cancel it. Zoom class, cancel it. That is a day of mourning. A day for you to sit down with the exception of essential workers that really have to do their job. The essential workers, they have to do their job. But other than this, this is a day where you should do nothing but mourn Imam al-Hussein sallallahu alayhi And so, moving away from this and going back to that point, that in Ziyarat Ashura, we say 
uh, we say, oh Allah condemn. La'an Allah. Alladina, what is it? La'an Allah man ummatan qatalatkum aljamat asrajat wa aljamat wa tanaqabat. May Allah con condemn the people who put the saddles on the horses. They put the saddles only. That's what was their job. They just saddled the horses to send them to fight Imam Hussein. May Allah curse the ones who bridled the horses, put the reins on the horses. And may Allah curse the ones, tanaqabat means the ones that wore the niqab. That there were men that placed face coverings on their face. Perhaps this is what it is uh, alluding to. For them not to be seen and not to be known. That they didn't want the imam to know that this is them that have come. That these are the people that turned against the imam. That these people that covered their faces because they knew the crime that they were going to do. What is it that pushed them towards this? This is very important for us to look into. So the, the two hadith we spoke about, he says that it's because the demons that block out our heart. And it's because we talk too much. We live in an era where people talk so much about nothing. Anything they find, social media, let's share it forward. They just put random things on there. They just say a lot of things. When you speak too much, you make a lot of mistakes. This tongue of ours is something that we are going to be punished for. One word could have supported, some, could have pushed someone to support Imam al Hussein, and another word can push somebody to go away from Imam al Hussein. Some people who have nothing better to do 355 days a year, on the 10 days of Muharram, they get up and they start talking about things that don't concern them. We have maraja for these rulings. And very soon, in the coming days, probably, inshallah, they don't. I hope they're too busy to do it. But they'll sit down and start typing up about why this thing is incorrect and that history book because all of a sudden they're a history. You know, they're a major on Arabic history, mashallah, on Islamic history. This history book was this and that history book. And I, and I, I read somewhere, just like it, I find it fascinating that in, in the current situation, you have people that don't, some of them are concerned with their religion, some of them are not. And they put every effort to find out this, you know, to try and prove this disease is real or not real, or the vaccine is real or not real, or whatever it is, and they go all the way to say, Oh, I found it, it's a cabal of blood drinking pedophiles that are controlling all of this. Okay, subhanallah. In the real world, it's not. In the real world, what does it come down to? Real world, it comes to a few guys meeting under a shed, Saqifat Bani Sa'ad. This is it. This is the real conspiracies. Read about that real conspiracy. The conspiracy that really affected every human being. By coming up with random conspiracy theories with no basis. They just get statistics with no basis. If you tell them anything, they tell you it's a lie. It's just like sometimes when you argue with some of the Muslims and you tell them this hadith, they say it's weak. This hadith, we, we don't accept this hadith. Why? I only accept the hadiths that support my narrative. Subhanallah. This is the same thing. So we go back to the core point. Excuse the digression. And we look at ourselves as youth today. This is important. That I'm borderline or outside of the, the realm of youth. But the youth today need to understand certain things. And these things they need to understand, number one, is you have a responsibility. This is the most important thing that you can give to, to a youth. The younger, the better. Some sort of responsibility. Even if it's the smallest responsibility. Even if it's the responsibility of cleaning their room, for example. Small responsibility, but it's something. It makes them feel they belong to the family unit. It makes them feel that they are part of something and they are needed. This is very important. Unfortunately, our youth today, they don't think of the future. What do they look towards, for example, extramarital relations? That they have relations outside of marriage. Whether it's before marriage or whether it's during marriage, this is a big issue. The reason this is a big issue is it's causing complications. You need to think to the future. You know how many people of our youth, for example, he tells you, oh, I've met a girl, I want to marry her. MashaAllah, this is very good. Yet yeah, she's Christian. What words does she have to say to become Shia again? I love that one. That's my favorite one. I've met a girl, but she's you know, from another faith. You know, and I want to bring her to Islam and uh, this is what I'm going to do. 
And you look at them and you say, Subhanallah, think to the future for a second. That if a person marries a girl that's Muslim, Shia, from our creed, from your same nationality even, it's difficult enough. Marriage and starting a family is difficult enough. But you go and complicate it by going with somebody from a complete other creed. It's important for you to always think uh, of the awaqib. As the Holy Prophet says, if you want to do something, think of the final outcome. Think of the final outcome. So in general, for the youth, you have to be wary of how you deal and trade with the opposite gender. Do not be fooled by what they show us as what is cool. Wallahi, and we're living in an era, it's, it's unbelievable. If a girl is attractive enough, or not, rather not attractive, she makes herself appear that way and makes a short video, people will listen to whatever she's going to talk about. She failed year 10 biology, but that doesn't matter. She's going to tell you exactly how COVID worked. People share it and watch it. They love it. Say, ah, oh, this, this, this is exactly what it must be. Why? Because this is what uh, XYZ is saying. The other thing that we have, and these are the things that we have to cleanse in, in these 10 days, we have an opportunity. Wallah. I'll tell you something. I'll let you in on a little secret. <laughs> and this little secret is, do you know a lot of the time when we listen to lectures in Muharram, with the exception of a few people that do specific studies in certain things, and their lectures usually aren't very interesting, they're not fun, but they're good, you learn from them. The majority of the things are things that are pro you've probably already heard. Don't sin, go and pray, it's nothing new, don't lie, don't cheat. The difference is it's in Muharram. And right now we are in the environs or the environment of Imam al Hussein, the biodome of Imam al Hussein, that this is what we are surrounded by. And with this, our hearts are softer and we accept things better. These 10 days are a chance for us to detox ourselves from sin. And I'm just going to stop for these 10 days and, and move away from these sins. Why? So I can move towards somebody who becomes of the Ansar of Imam al Hussein. This is so important. I'll tell you the biggest tool that you have. You know, in the modern day, we see a lot of people and they'll come up with all sorts of things. Now, I don't want to put these things down you find something that works do it fantastic you find something that helps you quit smoking do it something that finds you it helps you it's a book and he's a non-muslim doesn't matter it's good if it works it helps but what gets me is when someone comes and say oh you have to hear this jordan peterson guy changed my life completely how please tell me you have 12 imams a holy prophet books of hadith as much as you want People, a million lectures online of people explaining this to you. He told me to clean my room when I wake up. Make my bed. It's good. It's not a bad thing. He told me, stand up straight and put your shoulders back. Oof. Change the way my, my life works. Allahu Akbar. Bring that back and compare it to what we hear from the Imams, from the Ahlul Bayt. It's another level altogether. You're talking about who? And again, I'm not trying to put it down. Read those books. It's good. And you'll learn things and you'll advance, but we have something that's far greater. Why would you be happy with the morsels when you have something, the main meal? You push the main meal and look for the crumbs that have fallen on the floor. We come back and talk just quickly, just lightly, if I want to pass over a few other things that, that we need to really look at. As a youth, or anybody for that matter, it's never too late to change. Never too late. There's a few narrations, there's one narration, and I'll just mention it in quick passing, where uh, it's narrated by one of the companions of the imams. He says, I saw somebody walking around the Kaaba saying, Allahumma ghfirli wa inni a'lamu annaka lan taghfirli. Oh Allah, forgive me, but I know that you will never forgive me. I don't want to give you the, long, the whole story. But in short, this is one of the people that transported the head of Imam al-Hussain sallallahu alayhi from Kufa to Damascus. So when they told the Imam a sajjad Imam al sajjad said, Wallah, Allah would forgive him. But for the fact that he has despaired from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he won't get forgiveness. Because he's saying he despaired. This is the short version of the narration. The long version is, is, is good, forgive me. But I, I just had to go through it quickly. Now, the point is that there's still time. You're on this world, whatever it is that you've done, this is the time. The biggest tool that you have is the nur from Ahlul Bayt, definitely. Bigger than that tool is what? 
Bigger than that tool is having a moment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're the path to Allah. But you have a moment and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, akhraj habba dunya min qalbi. Take out love of this world from my heart. Akhraj habba al-ma'asi min qalbi. Allah, take the love of sin from my heart. Between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is your path to get away from the internet addictions. These internet addictions that are destroying families. These internet addictions that are destroying the fertility rates. These internet addictions that are pushing up the poor mental health that we have. And this is a subject on its own, but I'm just saying it's never too late. And this is the time to walk away from this. Drugs. Music. These are things that go between you and Allah. Drugs, people taking drugs and taking it normal. If they're not taking illicit drugs, they're taking prescription drugs. And the thing is they convince themselves that they have some illness. I'm sure people do have chronic illnesses. But subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yeah, he, he teaches us preventative measures. All right, they didn't work, you're sick now. So go and find out what the actual cause is. Go and find out what the actual cause is. I remember a person, he had an illness. He went to the doctor. It was one of those old school doctors. He walked in and he said to him, I have this illness. Can you run this test for me to see what's wrong with me? The doctor just looked at him at the door. He goes, don't even sit down. Go and lose 30 kilos and come back and see me. Why? He showed him, this is the core of your problem. With all due respect, I understand that people have difficulties with, with weight. It's, it's, with all due respect to everyone. I myself have difficulties with weight. But the issue is... And that there are certain things, this is the time to move away from them. This is the time to get away from the drugs. Otherwise, you'll be like those people of the Kufa, that when the Imam spoke to them, they were deaf. They couldn't hear. They couldn't understand. So number two, we have to look after our appearance. First, I said that we need to uh, have responsibility. Number two, our appearance. Do we appear like people who are the followers of Abu Abdullah al Hussein? This is essential. It's essential, at minimum. We know, we've, of, throughout the year, Sheikh Muhammad, myself, and other, other English lecturers we have in this country, and all over the world have spoken about hijab and the importance of hijab. Do we look like people? You know this message and everything that I'm speaking about. I sit here comfortably and speak about it. But do you know how it got here? Through a lot of blood. Through a lot of death. The imams and the anbiya that brought this message to us, this is where it came from. The message for hijab came from Sayyidah Zainab sallallahu alayhi From Fatima al-Zahra sallallahu alayhi These people that were harmed and tried for this message to reach us and then I just throw it away like it's nothing. I take it like it's the, small, the lightest thing. Not important, no. This has travelled 1400 years to get to you. This has travelled through so, so much oppression to get to you. Is this how you become a supporter of Imam al Hussein? By saying to say the Zainab salam Allahi alayha, that yes, I understand that this is the hardest thing for you. Was it not? And I ask Imam al Sajjad, will you stop crying? Every time they give you food, you remember Hussein, you cry. Every time you drink water, you remember Imam al Hussein, you cry. Every time you walk in the street and you say a butcher and he's about to slaughter a sheep, you come to him and you tell him, Have you given this sheep water? Because my father, Abu Abdullah, was slaughtered without any drink of water. That's Imam al-Sajjad, And then I turn around, and when they ask him, will you not stop crying, Imam al-Sajjad says to him, because he says to him, isn't it for you, al-qatl, al-qatl lakum aada, wa karamatakum min Allah shahada Death is normal for you, and it's an honor for martyrdom. He says, yes, this is the case. But is it normal for us, for our women to be taken prisoner? These are the women folk of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then I see this and what do I do? Hijab, no hijab, half hijab. It's important. Think about it for a second. Look, I know it's tough. Who's this guy? He's not even a woman and he's trying to tell me what to do. I know. I know it's tough. The shaitan will give you excuses to, to make you feel like, you know, why is he he's saying this? And forgive me for this. And it hurts when people come and tell me, you mispronounced this or you said something, it hurts. But I take it as good advice. I know they mean well by it. Modesty. The way we dress for our brothers, the men out there. Unacceptable to walk around with a singlet. Alhamdulillah, it's winter. Tomorrow in the summer, 
Walk around with a singlet and your mother is covered head to toe and your, and your wife is covered head to toe. Have some respect. This is important. Do you think this is the dress of the people that followed Imam Al-Hussein sallallahu alayhi And we're going to speak about them inshallah. And I just wanted to touch on a few of these. So most importantly, how do we get out of these things? How do we get out of these difficulties that we're in in this time? We need to connect. In this period, we have the ability to connect to Imam Al-Hussein sallallahu alayhi we have the ability to connect to Allah through our prayers. Take a break. Just drop it down a gear when you go to pray. That's all. Slowly drop it down a gear. Understand what you're saying in your qira'ah. Understand what you're saying. The companions of Imam al-Hussein were people who were connected to the Holy Quran. People who would pray during the night and they would fast during the day. These were people who were sincere in everything that they did. So when they saw Imam al-Hussein, that was enough. And we'll see in a second of what they said what proved uh, their sincerity to Imam al Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is very important. We need to stop sinning. It doesn't happen in one day. Maybe two, maybe three, maybe four. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow that light to connect back with you. There's a hadith that says when somebody starts to love the dunya, and yani they start to sin, the first thing Allah takes for them is, is ladhat munajat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a, there's a delight in doing dua, Allah. But when you sin a lot, that delight, it goes away. When you stop sinning, for Allah brings that delight back to you. There's a delight in listening to Musab al-Hussain sallallahu alayhi wa But it disappears. Imam Ali says that the tea ducts only dry up from the hardness of the heart. And the heart only hardens from what? Hardens from what? From the amount of sins that we do. This is something that's very important. I don't want to take too much of your time. صلى على محمد وآل محمد On this evening we commemorate the companions of Imam al-Hussain sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and these companions we learn so much from the level and, and where they were and what they were Remember I mentioned Nafi' bin Hilal al-Bajali Nafi' bin Hilal is one of the greatest companions of Imam al-Hussain sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and, you know, on that night, and this is what I want to speak about, that night when he tells them, and he tests them multiple times, that go, they don't want anyone else but me. And if they get me, they'll let you all live. You are free from my allegiance. The bay'ah is gone. Go. Be free. Some of them, with detail, he'll tell them. They go, I know you have children in, in Kufa. Go. Be with your family. That I know that you don't have to be with me. On that night, Sayyidi Sakina narrates that when Imam al-Hussein said to them, Al-Layl qad ghashiyakum fattakhaydhuhu jamala. He says, the night has blanketed over you. Take it as, a, as a, a transport out of here. And if you're afraid to go, turn off the candles so no one can see who leaves. And each person that leaves, take the hand of his companion and take him with him. Allahu Akbar. These people were tested in this way and the ones that remained were the ones that were sincere. That's it. They understood that this is Hujratullah al ard Today we have our Imam, Imam al Hujjah al Farj al Sharif. This is the same. You don't think that when the Imam sees our deeds and our actions, he asks Allah to forgive us, but does he not look at us and say, Where, when? You're asking for my reappearance and yet you're working for the other side. This is what they call khidlan, deception. And so Imam al Hussein one night he's walking outside of the tent. And Nafa ibn Hilal begins to follow him. Imam al Hussein hears somebody behind him. He says, Who is this? He says, My master, this is Nafa. And he says, Nafa, come stand next to me. What are you doing out here? He says, Master, I'm scared that someone will try and kill you. I want to be by your side. I'll protect you. Imam al Hussein puts his arm around Nafa and he brings him close. And he says to him, Nafa, look out there between these two hills. No one can see you. Just go. Go straight to these hills and get out of there. Nafa falls to the ground and begins to kiss the feet of Imam al-Hussein. He says, Ya Aba Abdullah, I will, never, I will never leave you. May the wild beasts eat me while I'm alive. Leave you, Aba Abdullah. You were everything, Aba Abdullah. Salam Allah. We see with the other companions of the Imam, these great companions, companions like Muslim ibn Awsaja. Muslim ibn Awsaja, he, and each one tells us something different. He speaks of the obligation of being with Abu Abdullah al-Hussein. 
He says to him, when he tells them that leave me, they all begin to cry and at once they all begin to talk. Together they say, Ya Abu Abdullah, we will never leave your side. How? Because in their hearts they could see. Their hearts weren't stopped by sin. With the others, when Imam al Hussein tried to call unto them, like uh, Ubaidullah al Jafi, Imam al Hussein came and told him, Come. And he said to him, Take my sword and take my horse, but I'm not going to die for you. Imam al Hussein says, We have no need for your sword or for your horse. I don't want anything. I'm offering you salvation. So Muslim ibn Ausajah, he says to him, Wallah, law alimt anni uqtal thumma uhya, thumma uhya, thumma uhraq, thumma. يُفْعَلْ بِذَلِكَ سَبْعِينَ مَرَّةً مَا تَرَكْتُكَ فَكَيْفَ إِنَّهَمَا هِيَ قَتْلَةً وَاحِدًا ثُمَّ الْقَرَامَةَ إِلَى الْأَبَدِ He says to him, even if I knew that I would be killed and brought back to life and killed and brought back to life and burnt 70 times, Wallah, I wouldn't leave you. And how could I leave you if it's one death, but it's blessed forever? So he's basically describing the fire of hell. Allah says in the fire of hell, that every time you are burnt, your flesh comes back and you are burnt again. So he's showing us the obligation of being with Imam al Hussein. Muslim ibn Ausaja was the first martyr of the companions of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. We see the duty and the love of the likes of Zuhair ibn al Qayn. Zuhair ibn al Qayn was somebody who was known for his recitation of the Holy Quran. Someone that was known within uh, the Muslim world as someone that is so great. And so when he says this, he, he stands up, he, he describes the love and duty for Imam al Hussein. He says something that is so great that, wallah, it's something that we cannot even fathom. Just look at the level of love and connection Zuhair has to Imam al Hussein, according to the narrations. He says, Wallah, law kanat al dunya lana baqiya, wa kunna fiha mukhalladin, ala inna firaqiha fi nusrik wa muwasatik. He says to him, by Allah, if this world was forever, that we don't, if we die in it, we're gone, but we, if we live, we live forever, then I would choose dying and helping you, Abu Abdullah, over this. I would choose you over even remaining within this world. This is obligation. And finally, we look at uh, the last companion, Burair bin Khudair. Burair bin Khudair, he says to him, Oh, Abu Abdullah, wallah, Allah has done me a favor that I can be cut up in, uh, uh, that I can be cut up instead of you and your grandfather will be my interse interse uh, intercessor on the day of judgment. That Rasulullah will intercede for me. These companions that had this sort of love for the Imam because their hearts were genuine. Their hearts were sincere. The Imam told them, leave. They said, no way. Go. No way. We have a similar feeling. It's small, but on a small level, when you want to go ziyarat to Imam al-Hussein, what's wrong with you? Iraq, wartime. Are you crazy? You're going to go there. Look at the difficulties. And then still you end up going to Imam al-Hussein. On this night when we commemorate, I want to talk about two of the companions. And these two companions, there are too many and too many stories However, these two are companions of the Imam that we don't regu regularly mention. One of these companions is John, the servant of Abu Dhar. And the beauty about John, the servant of Abu Dhar, is the fact that he was black. The reason I say this is because racism is rife everywhere in the world. But Imam al Hussein, sallallahu alayhi, when he saw this, he says to him, John, you're a servant with us. You're a, you're a paid servant here. You don't have to be here. You're free. John begins to cry and says to him, Oh, oh Abdullah, when you would give me pay and food, I was with you. And now you're going to die. I think I'll leave you. By Allah, I will not. He says to him that I am black in color. And my blood is black. And I smell bad. Do you know why he says this? He says this because us, when we sin, this is how we smell. You know when you think of a sin, the angels smell this. John had basira. That he could smell and compared to Imam al Hussein, he is saying that I am lowly, but I want to mix this black lowly blood with your pure blood, O Abu Abdullah. When John goes off and, and fights valiantly, kills, they say, 25 men, is martyred, Abu Abdullah runs towards him. This person 
that has shown his servitude and as if he has no value. And Abu Abdullah, as they say, places his cheek on the cheek of Jean. They say that even after they took back the body of Jean, he smelt of musk for days. The body smelt of musk. And finally, the Christian. And we live in a time where everyone loves Hussein. Everyone commemorates Hussein, even the Christians. The Christian Wahhab was somebody that turned to Islam. But on the day of Ashura, he told his wife that I want to go into battle. That I'm going to go down and help Imam al Hussein. She looked at him, she said, we are newly wed, we've just been married. You make sure that you come back to me. You know when someone's newly married, the wife doesn't leave you, she doesn't want to leave your side. She has her husband there and she says to him, go, but make sure you come back. So, so uh, Wahab goes down and begins to fight. And his mother was there and his mother was cheering him on to fight. Fight and protect these people. These beloved people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down upon us like Abu Abdullah al-Husayn. Wahab begins to fight and then he turns back and he comes back. As he's coming back, his wife calls out and says, Wahab, go back until you die for Abu Abdullah. Wahab says to her, why do you say this? You said you missed me. She said, did you not hear wa'iyat al Hussein? Abu Abdullah standing alone, wahidan, faridan, gharibah, he's alone. And he calls out, ala hal min nasirin yansuruna. Is there not a helper that will help us? Is there not someone that will come and be an sister of our aid? Is there nobody who will come and protect the haram of Rasulullah? Wahab goes down into the battlefield and fights until he is martyred and killed. The narration says that when they kill him, they cut his head off and throw it back to the mother. The mother picks up the head, she says, what we give for Aba Abdullah, she kisses it, we do not take back. As-salamu alayka ya Aba Abdillah Wa ala al-arwah al-lati hallat bifinaik Alaykum minni jami'an salamullahi abadan ma baqitu wa baqiya al-laylu wa al-nahar As-salamu ala al-lati وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين يا الله we ask you to hasten the reappearance of our holy Imam Ajla Farjul Sharif to rid this world of the tyranny we ask you to have mercy on the deceased particularly the ones that have died recently and I made a small list uh, of the ones who, ha who had died recently as Sayyid Adil al-Alawi rahmatullahi alayhi who had died just before Muharram uh, Hajj Salah Jubayli who had died just recently before Muharram Al-Hajj Araf Abdullah Araf Abdullah is someone who has great, has great grace over me uh, my, my teacher and, and the mentor when I was a child rahmatullahi alayhi he died overseas Al-Hajj Salah Jubayli somebody who gave his time for Abu Abdullah and Sayyid Rida Haydar. Inshallah, I haven't forgotten any better. Sayyid Rida Haydar, I don't know him. But I know his son. And someone that is raised in that manner. And, and is, is, that gives he all his time for the duty of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Whenever he is called upon, may Allah have mercy upon all of those and all of our deceased. May Allah cure our sick. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on our dead. May Allah purify our hearts and allow us to be of the ansar of Aba Abdullah al-Hussain sallallahu alayhi wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen rahimahullah man karat surat al-mubarak tal-fatiha wa ahda thawabaha ila arwah al-mu'minina wal-mu'minat masbukatan bis-salat ala muhammad wa ali muhammad